the last meeting. On the 22nd of March, are those minutes agreed? Any matters arising from the minutes? And it's on the agenda, Chair, thank you. Okay. So I'll sign them. Item number three, and um, it's the Grand Holden audit findings on pages nine to thirty. And we've got Mike Thompson here to give a presentation. If everybody's ready, and you're ready, Mike. I'm ready. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so I'm Mike Thompson from uh, Grand Thornton. I'm a director at Cami. Uh, my two colleagues, Jed Small and Lucinda Highfield, who, who have done most of the work uh, in relation to the audit. So. Start with a thanks to them and a thanks to Ian and Sam and the team for, for, for their efforts because uh, many of you will know that this year was the first year that the sort of deadline came forward to the end of July. So uh, next Tuesday can't come quickly enough, I think, for most of us. But uh, So just going through the headlines of the report, it is a, a very positive report. This bridges from the, the time when um, the authority gives the accounts to the sort of formal sign off and then conclusion of the audit. Uh, uh, as I said, the deadline is next week, so we're ahead of that, and we'd hope to complete everything today, so we are we are finished today. Um, just in relation to the headlines, then, they're on pages 11 and 12, so we look at your financial statements, and we, we give an opinion on those. Uh, other than two relatively minor items around disclosure, um, it, it's, a, it's a clean opinion, uh, it's an unqualified opinion, and that's, that's the important thing for the, for the committee to note. Uh, we're also required to look at other information that you provide to us, so your annual governance statements and your narrative report and broadly report anything that comes to our attention. If there's anything within those documents that actually doesn't chime with, with what we understand about the authority, I'm pleased to say there's nothing in there that we need to bring to the attention of the committee. We're also required to give a, a conclusion on, on your value for money arrangements. Uh, and further into the report on pages 13 and 15, there's some bit more detail about the work we've done around that. The main challenge we've seen around that for, for uh, this authority, and obviously many other public sector bodies, is, is around the financial sustainability and the, and the challenges you have in relation to um, sort of funding and, and financing for the future. So, uh, pleased to say, actually, with, with the sort of outturn for this year and the arrangements we've seen in place over a number of years, um, and, and have been part of the sort of budget strategy days that you had in the past that we, we can see sort of a plan, a strategy a, a, and a history of delivery against those items. So, so we, we've concluded on a, in a positive direction in relation to, to that conclusion as well. Over the page on page 12, it, it, there's a box called statutory duties, uh, which we have in the past had to do work around, but pleased to say this year has not been, to our, been brought to our attention. So. Uh, so that, that's, uh, again, a positive. The rest of the report then just goes into some detail about the work we've actually done, the uh, benchmarks we use to judge what we report back to you. So that's covered off in re relation to materiality on page 13. And then over the next couple of pages are the significant audit risks. So these are not risks to the, to the authority as such. These are risks to us giving a, a, a wrong opinion uh, in, in relation to the account, so they're just where we, we uh, place our emphasis in, re in relation to the audit. So they're actually on, as you would expect, the sort of big numbers in the accounts, but also where there's, there's, there's places within the accounts where there's judgment or estimate. Uh, and again, we've, we've done a range of work around those, which is, is set out on pages 14, 15, 16, uh, and concluded that there's nothing that we actually need to bring to your attention. The work has been satisfactory uh, and the evidence supporting our judgments has, has been forthcoming from the authority. If we look at accounting policies and what we've, again, we've, um, we've commented positively in relation to those. Uh, then there are a range of other communication requirements and um, independence things we need to bring to your attention. And, and again, it, it, is all, it is all positive. Towards the back of the report then, we, as I said, we talk about value for money in a bit more detail on page 23. But that's sort of really just em sort of emphasised the key points.
points in relation to that. And then the, re the requirements of the, towards the back of then uh, uh, con confirmation of our fees and our independence in relation to, to the audit of, of, of the authorities. So, Chair, yeah, that, that's all I wanted to say. I'm happy to take any questions or observations. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, I would like to say thank you very much for a very comprehensive report. What's your, what's your view, really? What is the view of Brentall on, on, on how we're using our reserves, please, for the benefit of anyone? So, so reserves are, are there for a, a reason, aren't they? They're, they're sort of, uh, you've got sort of, uh, sort of general fund reserves, which are, in a sense, most treasurers, are, well, treasurers are required to sort of take a view on what what is an acceptable level of those, and they're essentially sort of rainy day. If there's a disaster, what, what would you, um, would you have enough money to sort of cover off such a situation? And uh, it's very much a. Um, a view that the treasurer has to take, and and you know we look at that and we we say does that look sensible in the context of some of the risks? You then have sort of what are called earmarked reserves, which are there for specific reasons, um, and as I say, through the budget strategy and the planning that we've seen, then they're yeah, quite clearly there for, for for different purposes. Some of them can be to uh, help you with transformational operational change. Some of them can be because of investment capital type schemes. So it's actually taking them in the round. It's you know we, we take a view on that in the sense that it, the, the treasurer is taking a view and has, has balanced the risks out that within his financial strategy over a three five maybe longer term period then actually they are sufficient to meet those needs. Um, it's not to say that year year on year you might not need to use reserves for one reason or another because something may come up and you and you and you, you, can, you need to deal with it that way. But I think what we're looking for is over over time that you can't rely on reserves because it's not a sustainable financial position. So as long as you've got a strategy that sort of equals that out on occasion, might need to refer to them, but only over time is, is, is going in the right direction and is sustainable, then that's where our judgment comes. Thank you very much, Mike. Anyone got any questions? Last time, Thank you. Uh, it's a, a very relevant point that you asked, Jim. Um, we, from memory, we hold two million now about 3% of the 59 million pound budget. So one, that's adequate, I don't think you've already said that. So two, the minister says that we should be able to use our reserves to pay wages. Would you think that would be sensible? Good question. That's uh, I, think, I think you always need something in the back pocket because of a rainy day. Uh, my, my, my view would be you know, it was my personal finances that I'd always have some savings just in case something happened. Um, you know, it, it, the treasurer has to make the judgment of what is the right level of reserves. And um, I say we, we don't, we don't, as all this give any uh, specific guidelines on that. But I think if your reserves are zero or going negative, you, you know, we're zero, then we, we'd be coming to the bottom. It's a position of unsustainability. But as I say, we have to take that in the round through the financial strategy and the financial plan. I, I do understand your position, uh, in not being able to give an answer which may stray into the political. So if I were to just say, it is not sensible to use earmarked reserves to pay wages which you have not otherwise planned to do, it would not be a sensible thing. It doesn't sound like a sensible thing to me. Thank you. So for clarity, you're asking Councillor Adam if it's proven or not. And the answer Councillor Ziasha. Thanks, Mike. Page 19, give us a bit more on disclosures. It's obviously not included fair value for fair value for private. Page 17. Thanks for the money. For the communication requirements. Okay, it's, it's probably in a couple of places depending on the, uh, yeah. the, diff the different elements. So, uh, What page are you looking at, Councillor? 19. Top to the bottom of 19. Bottom to the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. There's something on the bottom of 19. It comes a bit later on as well in terms of. Um, yeah. so, so, what we're trying to do with any disclosures in the accounts, we're trying to um, put ourselves in the position of an informed reader of the accounts and whether they would understand the sort of position in the broader sense of where the authority is. So, there are accounting requirements for PFI. But then also there are what's called sort of fair value, which becomes part of the uh, sort of disclosure you know, within within the accounts. 
Uh, and so what we're trying to do there is say, well, what is that fair value look like over time? And uh, can you get a benchmark against something that would actually give the reader an account of what is that liability looking like for, for the longer term? So, so what we're saying there is that it, it's obviously having put anything in around that fair value, and we're just asking you to sort of look at that and say, is there a way of actually giving a view on that? Uh, I mean, that won't be a concrete view. It will sort of be a view based on, as it says here, sort of cash flow remaining over the life of the asset. So um, I don't know, Jed, if you want to comment on that anymore, or? If I may, yes. Yeah. Um, the, the disclosure is intended to inform readers about the sorts of risks that the authorities yeah. are managing. And with uh, a PFI contract, uh, the, the view of the accounting profession is that that is in some way analogous to a loan. So for a fair value, you would ask yourselves what could we obtain in terms of loan finance if we were to go to the market, given the current rate of interest and these sorts of cash flows, how much could we raise? Um, it's not a fair value of the asset. It's not a fair value of trying to buy that asset. It's not a fair value of the contract if we wanted to renegotiate the contract. It's purely looking at the cash flow side of it and trying to say, if you had a loan of this magnitude based on these cash flows, how would you view the authorities of this money? It has to be said, though, for a, a, a reader to understand that it would have to be quite an informed reader to appreciate the difference between the loan value, uh, its fair value, and its uh, uh, accounting requirement to show the amount of You're happy with that answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? <coughs> Can we agree? Can we pause? Agree? So, yeah, just, just to say, um, once you've considered the, the next couple of items, then we'd have today to complete the audit and, and sign that off, and then that concludes the 78 uh, audit position. Thank you. Okay, we're on to now. Thank you. Well, when, I, when I stop looking in March, we're on to the right one. We're on number four now. Four. Statement of accounts, pages 31 to 152, and Mr. Treasurer. Thanks, Chair. Uh, as discussed, the authority is required to prepare a set of financial statements in a format that <laughs> set out the relevant accounting codes and standards. The statements of accounts attached to this report as Appendix A presents the required authority core financial statements for 2017-18 having regard to the various codes and regulations. The authority must approve the 2017-18 statements of accounts before the 31st of July 2018. The purpose of this report is to present the 2017-18 statements of accounts to this committee and request members approve the statements and sign it off for publication. As members have already heard, agenda item 3, Grant Thornton have issued an unqualified opinion on the statements of accounts, which is basically confirming the statement presents a true and fair view of the financial position of the authority and its income expenditure for 2017-18. And the statement has been prepared in accordance with the required codes and regulations. Paragraph 10, pages 32 to 36. Provide members with some background to the four core financial statements and summarise the 2017-18 movements and explains any significant changes to the previous year's figures. Section C, page 34 to 35, outlines the balance sheet movement between 2016-17, 2018-19 and in particular the movements on the authority's assets and liabilities. The code and regulations require a number of notional accounting entries and adjustments that are significant in value uh, to be included in the statement of accounts, such as depreciation and pensions. They are notional in nature, so they do not form part of the costs that must be funded by the authorities approved for the general fund budget. The table on page 33 outlines how the 2017 18 Neutral general fund outturn position, as reported in the next agenda item 5, becomes a £34 million adverse variance under the Statements of Accounts Code and Regulations, and it simply reflects the need to input these notional entries. Members are also asked to approve the letter of representation attached to the report as Appendix B. This simply states that the Treasurer and Chair of the Committee are not aware of anything that would alter the information contained in the statement of accounts.
comments. I'm happy to take any questions on the floor. Okay, any questions? Councillor Mapleton. Thank you, Joe. Just uh, page 105. In terms of the expenditure of income analysed by nature. Um, there appears to be, on employee benefits expenses, a, a £6 million pound increase in the figures, perhaps 12%, and a non of service expenditure, uh, a £2 million increase, by 18%. Can you explain that for a long time? If, if I could. If I could share, uh, it's not, I don't prefer the account in detail, but the colleagues behind me do, so I can invite one of those to see if you can ask the question. Sorry. The respective page here. Page 105. Or 66 in the other one. Well, okay, if, yes. just as a note of caution, if you can't provide that today, if you, if you gentlemen would like to provide it at a later date, is everyone that agrees with that? Yeah. Because it's just been too long. I mean, if, is it possible that this is to do with the pay rise? Uh, an element will be the pay rise, to be honest. Uh, other issues could be some sort of pensions, adjustments, mm -hmm. uh, and other associated benefits. Unless you can appreciate a lot of these entries, that's why sometimes difficult and notional. Yeah. They're not part of what we would normally be against the, the revenue budget position. And that means, unfortunately, we have to go really back into the technical details. Um, but I'm happy to do that as a written response, or at the end of the meeting, we should have an answer by then. Well, yeah. I think that's fair enough. Thank you. Um, do you know what? I'm going to ask a question on this. Just clarity for people, because you're never getting here. Under the unusual, unusable reserves, uh, page 35, unusable reserves are not generally available to fund the spend. The decrease in the pension reserve of 4.369 million to reflect changes in the liability of the pension schemes accounts for most of this increase. And I, I, I want, I need that to be explained more for everyone's benefit. Even myself? Yeah, um, so we classify reserves, either usable reserves or unusable, and it links into this requirement, some of the international financial reporting requirements, to prepare the accounts as if it was a commercial enterprise. So these unusable reserves isn't money the authority holds, it's a notional entry. So on the pension, if you take firefighters' pension scheme, year on year it can have significant swings depending on performance of the liabilities, etc. And it's a notional entry to say, compared to the previous year, our liability against that unfunded scheme has moved and the, the compensating entry is in these unusable reserves. So we try to classify it as unusable since it's directed that they're not available, it's not the authority's money, and it's something that you can't utilise. So it's just usually to do with the movements on either the pension or depreciation both of which are notional entries and I think it's over complicated to be perfectly honest. Yeah. I think the counter can be misleading. Hence where we, we've got a balanced position for the 2017-18 outturn. But these statement accounts will tell you £34 million pounds in deficit and it's all to do with movement mainly on pensions that are unfunded <coughs> and are managed by the authority and are not required to get funded into them. Okay, that's lovely. Please, my bonus. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, Chair I, I'm clearly not on this committee, but just um, a point I wanted to, to raise. Um, yesterday, a number of us were at the North West Fire Forum, and there's a lot of talk about reserves. Yeah. Um, and clearly, when we go to government, um, they tend to look at our reserves and think you know, that we're quite cash rich. Um, there's just a note on page 50 about the authorities earmarked reserves being 25 million, which on paper makes us look as if we've got um, quite a lot of finance available to us, yeah. which clearly we have, but I understand that that's all again, earmarked for various things. Could we just um, have an explanation on record as to what that finance is? Because a number of us come in for criticism about holding all these reserves when clearly they are earmarked or, or obviously restricted for future use in a number of uh, things. So perhaps it <coughs> yeah, I can mean, I mean, either pick that up now or in the next item which has yeah. an analysis of the reserves. Whichever. So 
Either way, either I can come back to it in the next report and refer to the annex that outlines all those reserves and go through the main ones and say and explain what the usage is, land usage, and when we expect to use those reserves. Yeah. If that helps, or I can answer it now. I don't mind it was just that we were talking about. the best for you, It might be in the next item, because I yeah. refer yeah, yeah. to save any confusion, if that's okay with that. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. Would everyone agree with that report, please? Thank you. Now we're on to number five. Revenue and capital out to 1532176. And with you again. Yeah, thank you. It's Hopefully this one will make more sense because it's not based on the international financial reporting standards. It's based on the common sense answer. Well, the auditors haven't heard me say that. Um, okay, so this is the report that provides members with a summary of the outtake position in relation to the approved 2017-18 revenue and capital budget. The report identifies a revenue saving of 2.4 million. However, after taking into account year-end reserves of 442,000 that are required in order to meet expenditure now planned for 2018-19. The net saving is 1.961 million or a 3% favourable variance of the revenue budget. The report recommends using the 1.961 million saving to increase the capital investment reserve by 1 million pounds in order to contribute to the required investment for the new St. Helens fire station, increase the inflation reserve by 200,000 due to the uncertainty over the outstanding 2017-18 and 2018-19 firefighter pay award, increase the firefighter recruitment reserve by 744,000 to fund the recruitment of firefighters over the next five years or so, ahead of expected firefighter retirement. Pages 154 to 157 provide members with some background information on the 2017-18 budget plan and budget updates approved throughout the year. Pages 157 to 160, paragraph 13 to 16, outline the revenue outtake position in the final budget and provide members with an explanation of the main revenue variances. Nearly 75% of the revenue saving comes from the employee budget as a result of vacancy savings and firefighter retirements being slightly ahead of the schedule. Appendix A provides a detailed analysis of the revenue outtake position. The table on page 161 and appendix 85 outlines the movements and reserves throughout the year. Paragraph 18 and 19 outline the proposed creation of recommended year end reserves. At the end of 2017-18, earmark reserves stand at 25.7 million, a reduction of over 4 million from the 2017-18 starting position, and an unchanged general uh, revenue reserve of 2 million. I'll come back to the table in a, when I uh, introduce the report if that's okay. As outlined in paragraph 22 to 24, £7.5 million of planned capital spend in 2017-18 has now been rephased into 2018-19. And the table on page 163 provides members with the details behind the rephasing of the schemes. And appendix B provides a detailed analysis of the capital outstanding. Members are asked to approve the report's recommendations over the use of the revenue under spend to increase reserves. But I'll go now back to the reserve statements, and we're probably best to look at the appendix A and specifically page 171. So what that highlights on the left hand side is a description of all the earmark reserves that you've established that shows how they proved throughout the year in the closing balance. I think if you to say, as the question was, you know, sort of the, the challenge over the level of reserves, the first thing is to notice there has been a four million pound reduction. And this probably links into the biggest significant capital reserve we have, which is the capital reserve, which towards at the end of 1718 it's getting close to £12 million pounds plus uh, when we increase it with some of the year end of the spend. And we've got, as you know, a number of station merger schemes going on. So the £4 million pounds was drawn down basically to fund the completion of the Prescott scheme. However, we've still got St. Helens 
uh, solvable Massey uh, to, to build, and we've only started building solvable Massey as we speak. What we're trying to do is avoid borrowing money because nearly 10% of our revenue budget is, co is committed to servicing historic debt. So there's a, there's a potential at the St. Helens scheme because the nature of land we've got to build and the size. We've got about £5 million in the current capital programme, uh, of which about £3 million has been funded from the capital reserve. That scheme and, and report becomes a mandatory approval. It's likely to significantly increase in, in costs. So to try and avoid borrowing three, four million pounds money, we're setting aside money to, to meet that capital cost. And that is repeated with the other schemes, it's the sole of Massey, again we've got to save three million, that we will draw down off this reserve to, to fund that. So the biggest single reserve you've got is a capital reserve. And the main intention of that is to fund the future capital, planned capital investment, um, and avoid borrowing because we've got to try and control the level of revenue budget committed already to, to fund that debt. You know, if, if it's already 10% of the controllable budget, if it grows higher than that and the budget's going to shrink in the future, you're going to have to make more staff cuts just to save this debt. Right? And then you've got the specific ones in terms of the recruitment reserve, three million pounds. Again, we've talked about the fact that over the next four, five, six years, of your 600 plus firefighters establishment, you're going to lose half those firefighters through natural retirement. Now if you wait till they retire and then recruit out your establishment budget, you're not going to have them available to serve on the appliances. So what we've agreed is create a resource to recruit in advance above your normal establishment. It's a temporary measure uh, to allow them to get the skills to serve effective firefighters. Uh, but you need a resource to do that and that's what that three million is for. Uh, we've got a smoother reserve there of just under 2 million. There is a planned use of that reserve over the next few years. That still allows you the time to avoid compulsory redundancies. As your budget has shrunk, you need to make savings and you've identified the reduction in your establishment. To fit in with the reduction in the money you get from government, you would have to make five factors compulsory redundant. What that does is gives you the time to allow the natural time of rates to come in and the time to re engineer the service but how happens to make those different. Decisions. Uh, you've got there a significant PFI reserve, £2 million. That comes into account about what's called smoothing out the cost of the PFI. Whenever you bid for a PFI scheme, you get an element of funding from the government as a grant. You've got your existing budget, but there's always the what we call an affordability gap because you're building a better asset. Now, that gap it changes over the life of the 30 years of the PFI. So each year, you probably have to build it, grow it to fund a charge, we call we smooth it out, we spread the grant and the resources over the life of the PFI and effectively that's what that is, it's smoothing out the cost of the PFI over the life of the PFI. If you didn't have that, you'd have to find additional savings year on year to pay for the charge. And then all the rest are specific uh, uh, reserves for training, for clothing, I think you've got a report on today's agenda about you know, your, your kit. So again, sometimes when you've got an additional one-off expenditure in the year in the foreseeable future, a project or a specific risk, you create the reserve to meet that, because you won't have the money in your base budget because that's already committed. Okay. Thanks for that. I would say trade level 50% goes in, the revenue support grants as well. Has anyone got any, any questions? Well, you mean that there's been so much talk you know, uh, from ministers principally and in the press that you know we've got all this money, why didn't we use it? Um, theoretically, you could take 500, 700,000 as one contribution, there, 700, this is a one-off, and for one year you could do something in terms of paying revenue expenditure. But that's it then. It's just putting off, you know, the, the, the plan is, really, the, the strategy of the authority we're trying to develop is to get rid of our, we have capital that we debt service, and we're basically paying rent for capital. Get rid of that. Let's have the rent back and use the rent money that we've got, revenue from year to year then, it, it then becomes revenue to increase the establishment. 
to, to, to bring in more bodies to keep the community safe. That's the plan. So here's the here's the moment almost. I know this is not the this is not the budget meeting. This is just the report on the outturn of our accounts. That that the authority, those that send us here, the representative bodies, the, the, the authorities that, that we represent, uh, to sort of say, well, look, we want to question a particular part of the the, the capital uh, outturn. Because our statement, our uh, report back to those that send us here, is that there is no free capital to make revenue changes of any significance. And that's, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, let, let somebody surely tell us that we're wrong, otherwise I think that statement has to go out strong and hard. Okay, thanks. There is a room, you can't change capital into yeah. Yeah. Good. Are you happy now? You've got anything else to give us saying? Um, and it's remiss of me. So you're happy to have a huge lesson, like Mr. Brown. Item 5 is uh, CF 048 on, on this item. So um, for legalities, I should have mentioned that in the first place. Um, just one thing, because I've got the answer to the previous agenda items question, if I can get back to members now. One of the reasons I didn't know the answer is it's all to do with these notional entries. Um, the increase of £6 million, basically split 50 50 between the current service costs associated with the local pension scheme and the firefighter pension scheme, and so it's these codes and regulations that require us to calculate these notional liabilities and values. So it's not a real thing. So the officers just close the minute. It's not. It's not a real figure. It's a notional entry. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd just like to, um, to 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 praise what you've done actually, because if you look at page one five five on on point number five, the efficiencies that we've we've made. I put one million reduce the management support services and other technical amendments. Um, despite these efficiency of the policy was left with no choice but to find the balance from the operational front line, potentially requiring a high saving as high as 1.9 million. So, has anyone got any other questions? Could I say thank you to, to you and your team? And could we have an idiot site guide so that we can just say, this is what we're spending on, this is what's left in the meetings, but that was all the jargon. Yeah. And that would be great for us to. Um, You're taking all the excitement out of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it would save a lot of paperwork as well. In and out of what we can and what we can't and what we can spend on and what we can't spend on. Um, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Can we have a motion to approve the agenda item number five? Motion and second. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not a member of this committee, I'm just there uh, alternating. Just, just going back to, it's, it's not so much a question as a, a clarification and just, just a comment. And it's around the earmarked reserves around the recruitment. Um, and for a long time, uh, as an organisation, we, we weren't able to, to recruit to the extent we have been. But what concerns, concerns me should concern all of us, and it, it's, it's alluded to in the, in the report that Ian's given us, is we will be, in the next five years, uh, losing 50% of the firefighters due to retirement and it's prudent of us to recruit and when you look at and certainly from a personal point of view that I've seen recruits that we've had over the last year to 18 months um, it's going to take time for perennial people to, to bed in and to be fully trained up to the extent um, and even longer to, to the experience of the staff that we will be losing through gradual retirement within the next five years. So that's going to take time. But certainly looking at them recruits and what they've gone through and their enthusiasm and the training that they've received from our um, dedicated staff, I can only say that I'm quietly, well I'm not quietly, I'm absolutely confident in the future yeah. of the service. Let's get through, let's get through this um, 
these years and times of austerity, and let's get, try and get back on an, an equal foot. It's not easy. It hasn't been easy so far. It's not going to be easy in the, in the short term, but at least we're trying to address that. So we're looking into the future. So yes, the staff is going up a bit, but it's going to come back down. So really, we, we have been very, very prudent, and it's good use, in my opinion, of the earmarked reserves. Thank you, Councillor Clement, for that contribution. I'm going to just say, you know, um, for the benefit of everybody, that um, the door is always open for any uh, member of the trade union to come and see the chief, the and myself. That offer is always there. Right, right. Um, and this is one of the best chains of command that I've ever uh, sat with um, as a member of the fire authority. It's all inclusive, something that doesn't happen in a lot of areas in, in, in local government. Can I say thanks to all the staff as well? We've got other items yet there. But particularly thanks to you, Ian, and all your team, and, and, and Mike, because it's hard to do the finances. And, uh, you know, a little bit of trepidation must occur when you've got to give presentations, and, you know, you'll have good sleep tonight. So, <laughs> <laughs> so can we go on to um, item number six, please? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah, thanks, Chair. The purpose of this report is to inform the authority on the completion of the North West tender process for the replacement of our structural fire kit uh, in relation to the EV framework and request the approval that the contract be um, offered to a fair bidder. And there's an appendices, which is a, a report that was received by the authority on the 27th of February with details. Some of the kind of considerations that have been taken on the replacement of the fire kit was currently got. I think kind of the two bits that I would I'd like to draw your attention to in the first instance. We've gone to a, a fuel kit model, um, and the fuel kit model, whilst being a little bit more efficient, was probably less effective than we would want it to be. So it saved some money, but in effect, what was happening is operation crews were unable to access the right kit at the right time, and, and sometimes wore ill fitting kits, and clearly it's important that the kit fits them to do the role and function effectively. As a result of that, we've chosen to revert back to where we were previously, which was to provide two kits to each individual to want them to wear, you know, in the course of their duties, and the other one's a spare foot should that kit get compromised or contaminated in any way, and then we replace that, and that would get sent off for, for cleaning. As a result of that, that's the, the process that we will adopt moving forward. That allows for the kit to be bespoke to the individual then, rather than necessarily just more a generalist approach. And that's probably particularly important around the unisex nature of the kit now. Mm -hmm. Not from unisex, it's something to be bespoke to you know, our female fire or male firefighters, so it's more reflective of the future of the fire and rescue service around the diversity of our workforce, and so it becomes a little bit more fit for purpose than it has been in the past. And so it's our intention to, uh, to move to that provision of two kits to all of our, our operational staff. It also, part of the, the initial report that was received in February, it also adds to the provision of a tech rescue jacket. And again, you've know, probably seen it more recently around some of the wildfire incidents that have been dealt with across the, well, the Northwest region, particularly of the, the UK more broadly, where some of, the, some of the kit that's worn by the firefighters isn't necessarily always the operational firefighting kit that would, it would go into a, a building where and so it's kind of reflective of the, the different roles that firefighters may fulfill. Tech rescue jackets are probably more applicable to go to road traffic collisions and so on and so forth. More adaptable, more flexible, allows us to be a little bit more detailed and, and access vehicles in, a, in an easier, uh, less compromised way. So the intention is to you know, replace our current fire kit, replace it with two, uh, two fire kits per person, and equally to include the provision of a tech rescue jackets to support the operational duties of all of our staff. The reason why I've brought to, to members is because given the, the cap the costs associated with it uh, and the potential for that contract to, to, for four years to run to potentially £800,000 um, and it is subject to members' approval because that contract clearly will see exceeds the contractual value of £250,000. So again, the recommendation members, you know the outcome of the tender process, and agree to award the contract to the successful uh, supplier. Happy to take any questions. Well, here's another example of what we pay out of the retainers. Well, that's the capital expenditure. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Everyone who's saying we've got loads of money 
is another example of how we've got it managing. Any, any questions, members? Can we agree that report? Mm -hmm. uh, because on, on our many station visits, you, you always got the bit of the complaint that maybe sometimes you do live on the people's kiss and this, that, and the other. And it's nice that people have got their own. Um, I just hope none of them are memory foam because it must be awful if you actually uh, have to wear a piece of equipment that is a uh, memory foam established and you've got the shape of the previous phase in, in, in the old so That will, will happen. Um, this is a bit like when I was a little bit in a bubble shower, that didn't make me set. Um, but I won't go into detail because it's getting recorded. Anyway, thanks very much, everyone. <laughs> Oh, oh. Sure. Oh yes, sorry, sorry Mike. Sorry, right. just, just one final thing. As we, as we race through the extent of the accounts, there's an appendix B on uh, item 4 that just needs signing by the chair and okay. the treasurer at the end. So so fine. Just making sure that was going to fit in there. Okay. Just I, I, I have a feeling that it's the chair of this committee. No. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. I've yeah. passed responsibility actually. Okay. <laughs> I've gone out of it. He's got the version ready to be yeah. signed. Yeah. Okay, so that's the order of the business. Yeah, that's so agreed that you sign that on our behalf and I'll take full responsibility. I'll sign on behalf of the chair. Yeah. <laughs> um, is that agreed? Indeed. Yeah, uh, can all members stay behind? All members of the fire department stay behind for that five minutes. Yeah, the chief wants to speak to you. Thanks very much, Trevor, for your hard work. Thank you. Uh, this was